Ronnie. The first question is about privatization in Ukraine. What is wrong with it? What uh, what uh, what are the main mistakes? Okay, the, I, I think you yeah you should yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your question. I think there's uh, there's a lot of things that are wrong with the privatization process as it is in Ukraine, starting with the fact that it's it's actually designed to not privatize anything. Uh, you know, it is it is a it's a classic case of a bureaucratic process where people who need to make decisions uh, are liable for their decisions and are not liable for not making any decisions. So as long as I've not decided, I haven't made a mistake. So <laughs> the other thing is that a lot of the privatizations that can take place in Ukraine, we had the case of OPZ, for example, in Odessa, uh, the skip report of his avod, uh, where uh, the, the, uh, the, the company had some issues that made it less attractive to investors, including a large debt to uh, one particular debt holder and so on. And that drives investors away. Another issue is about the valuation. There is prescribed methodologies for valuation of privatization assets uh, that do not correspond to the methodologies that I investors use these days. So if you have a methodology that says, well, you know, this chair here is worth $100 million, and you say, well, no, I'm an investor, I'm only going to pay $100 for it. Then if you say that's my minimum price, $100 million, no one is going to come. Now, just to, go to, to finish on this, uh, so we've not had any successful, transparent privatization in the past few years. Okay, it hasn't worked. But what I take optimism from is, uh, is that uh, uh, there is a new privatization law that has been approved in, uh, uh, in Parliament in the first reading, so it needs to go to second reading, it needs to be approved by the President. But that law, if it's passed, uh, gives Ukraine a much more modern framework for privatization. And I hope that uh, once that law is passed, we can actually bring more companies uh, in a better way to privatization in the future. Do you like this law? Yes, we were involved in the preparation of this law together with colleagues from the World Bank and the, uh, and the IMF and others. The USAID also gave some input. Uh, it was a very good cooperation actually with the Ukrainian authorities. And yes, we do like this law. Вы говорили, что фонду госимущества нужно дать больше полномочий. В то же время не думаете ли вы, что вот эти все проблемы, которые существовали с приватизацией, они связаны с тем, что как раз фонд госимущества находится в, скажем так, коррупционной, в коррупционных отношениях, да, в тесно работает в интересах определенных олигархов, которые на сегодняшний день контролируют государственные предприятия в Украине? Okay, so the, um, I wonder what's called, so, so state property foundation. Yes, state property fund. fund. Yeah. So you said that they need to have more uh, freedom uh, in this process. Apparently they they need, yeah, they need, but yes. In fact, the problem might be is that uh, if you give them more freedom, they already have uh, far too close and, uh, you know, it's a like corrupt relationship with some oligarchs. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when I mean freedom... Sorry, please. Oligarchs control, control the, government, uh, the governmental... Uh well, yeah, you're pointing to a, a, a well-known problem in Ukraine is that um, even though a lot of these companies are state-owned, their cash flows have been privatized a long time ago. So if you privatize them, you have to expect resistance from the people that are currently capturing this cash we are not going to be able to capture it going forward because there's going to be a private owner and the first thing they're going to do is to say, hey, this is my money. So you, you expect resistance. Now, the state property fund needs strong management and it needs strong independence. There's a reason why the uh, head of the state property fund is approved by the parliament. 
it's because it has to be an independent person. But you know what? You do not build institutions when there's one crucial element which is missing, and I'd like to see that. You need people in a position to make decisions, to have the courage to make these decisions. If the governor of the central bank does not have the courage to close down banks that need to be closed down, it doesn't matter that they're independent. If the governor has the courage to do it, then it changes things. I'd like to see the same thing in the state property fund. Если нет воли принятия решений, если а, как бы на государственном уровне решения не принимается, то как бы никакого прогресса не будет, ничего не будет происходить. То есть, если, например, там Центробанк не хочет закрыть тот банк, который надо закрыть, да, не хочет принимать это решение, тогда возникает проблема. А, проблема в том, что вот эти олигархи, которые а, контролируют государственные предприятия, они же их специально загоняют в долги для того, чтобы потом купить себе, а, забрать себе за бесценок, поскольку Предприятие, по сути, является банкротом, хотя на самом деле это как бы банкротство специально сделано им же. То есть, и если у нас сейчас начнут приватизировать массово предприятия, э, не придет ли это к тому, что за копейки их получат не э, бизнесмены, которые хотят влить европейские бизнес, э, инвестиции, а получат те же ну, олигархи, просто заберут за меньшие деньги, поскольку предприятие... Ну, как бы, uh, how to avoid the situation? So basically what happens now is very often when those uh, factories, for example, would uh, have to be privatized, uh, people who control them, mm -hmm. they on purpose bankrupt them so they can be privatized very cheaply. So as a result, the process is corrupt. So it's not going to be uh, a transparent process. Mm -hmm. It's going to be basically the same oligarchs, corrupt oligarchs, who are going to uh, grab those properties for next to nothing. How do you... Uh, well, I think you can avoid this. First of all, in order to avoid this, you have one basic thing which is needed, which is political will. Okay? There has to be someone telling the oligarchs that the uh, you know, game, is, game is over and we're going to play a different game going forward. And you can do this company by company, you can do this oligarch by oligarch, but you need the political will. That's the first step. The second step is you actually need to make sure that the, your privatization process is transparent, so that people can come and compete. So if you are the oligarch that has made this company worth very little, I can come and compete. And I can pay for that company. And maybe you will not get it. Если нет политической воли решить эту проблему, это нужно решать не как бы одним указом, а от олигарха, от, от олигарха, от конкретного предприятия, от а в каждом конкретном случае должна быть политическая воля, чтобы, это, чтобы этого не допустить. И второе, это то, что а, должен быть очень прозрачный процесс приватизации, то есть чтобы не было того, что эти люди единственные практически сами с собой да, борются, а чтобы могли прийти инвесторы, которые как бы перебьют и ну, приватизируют. You know, sometimes I hear people say, it's all transparent because it's televised, like we are today. Okay? I don't think that's enough. I think if you want to privatize something, well, you need three transparencies. Okay? The first is the transparency of who the buyer is. And by which I mean not just knowing that this is a Cyprus-based company with a lawyer that has a nice tie. You need to know who owns that company. Otherwise, you shouldn't be qualified to buy something in the privatization. Second thing is you need a transparency of the asset. Everyone needs to understand what is in this company. There needs to be sufficient information. And third is you need transparency of the process. Not just the last stage where the cameras come and you can bid, but the whole process needs to be transparent. If you have these three conditions that are met, then you can have good quality privatization. And then uh, the oligarchs that want to pay these assets on the cheap are going to be taken out by the market. Чтобы достичь этого, нужна полность, полностью прозрачность процесса. И три элемента, которые очень важны для этой прозрачности. Первый элемент – это кто покупатель, не какой-то юрист, который представляет какую-то зарегистрированную на Кипре компанию, а реально кто этот человек, кто владелец, кто стоит за этим. Второе – это, собственно говоря, стоимость реальной этой компании. Да? То есть не та, которая заявлена, а действительно провести как бы экспертизу и понять, сколько она реально стоит, поскольку ее можно оценить. И третье – это уже прозрачность самого процесса. То есть как все это проходит. Потому что а, прозрачность не то, что ты включил камеру и показал, а прозрачность это действительно вся информация, когда есть доступ ко всей информации в процессе. Вот э, о первом пункте, который вы назвали, что вам известно об интересах э, 
корпорации Дмитрия Фирташа, Фирташ, угу. его интересах в приватизационных процессах в Украине. What do you think, uh, uh, what do you know about the uh, Dmitry Firtash uh, Corporation and uh, its uh, interests in uh, privatization process in Ukraine? Do I do not know anything about this. <laughs> I'm not, I'm, да, конечно, но I don't, I, uh, я его не знаю. I don't talk to him, I don't know him, and I don't, certainly don't coordinate investments with him. Просто про одесские припортовые. About Odessa report. Because you, you mentioned that project about For example, one of the ways we tried to ensure transparency was to insist that the privatization could not take place unless there was at least two bidders, out of which one was a genuine strategic investor uh, and not uh, uh, an unknown party. That was the rule, and uh, because no bids came, the privatization was declared unsuccessful. So um, every company is going to have some local investor, some local interest. What we're trying to make sure is that you know these people pay the right price. And uh, the second question about uh, your plans to uh, investition in uh, our transport in Ukraine. Uh, mun municipal. Yeah, yeah, municipal Munici transport. Yeah. Yes. Um, we have plenty of plans. Uh, it, de it depends on the city. We have um, recently I visited Kremenchuk, mm -hmm. where we are financing uh, tramways, uh, trolleybuses. Sorry, and trolleybuses. Sumi. Sumi. Sumi have not been, unfortunately. I apologize. I know I need to go, but we have a project I know there as well. Uh, we have financed uh, uh, also municipal transport in places uh, like Lviv. We are going to sign uh, by the end of this year, I think early next month actually, uh, the, a large project for the Kharkiv Metro. Uh, it's a $400 million project, out of which EBRD is financing $160 million. EIB, the European Investment Bank, is financing $160 million, and the, and the municipality is financing the rest. Uh, and that is a sovereign uh, uh, project, so we're lending to the government, which is uh, then uh, on lending to uh, to the municipality. It's a huge project, and it it's also it's going to bring the metro further out to uh, a, a particular part of the city, which is underserved today. Only today you you have some buses, you have a lot of marshrutkas, uh, and uh, uh, but you do not have metro, and it's uh, um, dozens of thousands of people that live in that part of the city, including some internally displaced people, some refugees from the from the conflict in. Uh, in Donbass. So it's really important to bring this essential public service to that part of the city and that's what we are uh, we're doing with, uh, with Kharkiv. That's our large project, largest transport, municipal transport project this year. But we have uh, a lot of them, be it in, uh, uh, with trolleybuses. We are also looking at uh, providing trolleybuses to Mariupol, for example. Uh, about and about Sumi, well, you know, we are happy to have Sumi as a client, but again, I've not I've not visited, so um, I cannot comment about on it. About uh, trolleybus, uh, I know that uh, bank. Yes, our uh, bank wants uh, to give us money uh, to give us credit, maybe. Credit. Yes. Uh, um, for for trolleybuses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, when? I don't know the details of that project. I'm sorry. Uh, and about uh, Euro two. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, now uh, our. Сейчас наша городская власть планирует закупать новые троллейбусы. Вот речь идет о тех, которые в кредит за счет денег Европейского банка с требованием евро четыре стали экологическими. В то же время здесь уже давно, если я не ошибаюсь, евро шесть six. Okay. Euro six. Euro they're, they're planning to buy yeah. Euro four, while in Europe it's already Euro six standard for okay. ecological standard. For public transport. Well, I don't know again the details of that of that project. Mm -hmm. I think what we're trying to do always is to uh, get the municipalities to move up in terms of standards. If you can move from two to six, so much the better. If you're moving from two to four, that's already progress. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> All right.